This is the Longbox Review comic book podcast. I'm your host, Eric. Welcome to the show. 45 years ago, I started reading and collecting comics. And for today's episode, I'm going to talk about some of those that were published in October 1978. This then is my comics history. So in October, I purchased Amazing Spider-Man number 188 and Green Lantern number 112. I cannot recall if I bought these at the same time or not. I hadn't realized or I have forgotten um, until researching this, uh, my comics history, that I bought subsequent issues of both Amazing Spider-Man and Green Lantern, both Marvel and DC titles, so early on. Um, In my vague, foggy recollection, I got some issues and um, I just never, I guess, equated that I had bought 187 and 188 of Spider-Man and 111 and 112 of Green Lantern. So, uh, however, that did not last long, (laughs) as we will see next time. So I bought those two issues, and I'll be talking about those here in a little bit. But other comics that came out uh, in October 1978 that I purchased later include the following. I bought Daredevil number 156, which came out October 3rd. Uh, this is the one uh, that has the cover with the uh, the old school, the OG uh, Daredevil red and yellow tights. Uh, there's a character uh, in a boxing ring boxing the all red Matt Murdock Daredevil that we know. Um, I have not read that yet, uh, however. So it's been in my collection for uh, not quite 45 years, but it's close to 35. Also uh, acquired, because I did not purchase these, were two Star Trek issues from Gold Key. Uh, It's the Evictors and the Choice. This is number uh, 11357. And uh, the Psycho Crystals, number 11358. And according to... Uh, Mike's Amazing World of Comics, the release dates for the uh, the former and the latter is October 7th and 8th. So that seems odd, but okay. Uh, as I said, I acquired these. I did not buy them because my mom bought both of these issues, I think, at a Kmart. Uh, we, we, were, we were frequent shoppers at Kmart uh, when I was a kid, and um, uh, she gave them to me and my, my younger brother, I think, to occupy our time. <laughs> Or I don't know. I was a, I was a big Star Trek fan even then, and um, she may have uh, wanted to treat uh, treat me. And of course, she'd have to get something for my little brother. So she she bought. Uh, I got the Evictors and the Choice, and my brother got the Psycho Crystals issue. Even though he did not care for Star Trek, like, especially like I did. Uh, and so after that, I I just kind of let him think it, uh, it was his. Uh, but, uh, irony of ironies, um, I only have my issue still in my collection. So I don't know what happened to that other, that other issue anyway. And then, uh, also, uh, acquired later, purchased later, actually, uh, Marvel super special number eight, the Battlestar Galactica, uh, uh, uh original movie adaptation featuring Ernie Cologne art, which I did not realize, um, this this uh, this Marvel Super Special that I got was part of several issues I bought from a coworker. Uh, I have not read this, and I came to a realization about this uh, as I was researching uh, stuff for uh, the next episode. So I'll be talking about that later. Adventure Comics number four sixty one. Uh, I covered issue four fifty nine back in two thousand nineteen in March, uh, but I don't recall anything of significance about this particular issue 461 because i found this anthology title even though i was kind of excited about 459 and i talked through all the different stories and some of them were really kind of crazy and some of them were just okay uh, i read the rest of those anthologies that featured the 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 uh, dc superheroes and they were just it was just okay i didn't feel like i needed to get back to it and uh, I still have all the other ones. Uh, once Plastic Man and Star Man, and then later Aquaman, come into the the anthology title to read through. So I'm I'm looking forward to uh, examining those, some of them again, because I did get at least one or two of that later set of characters in this in 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 Adventure Comics. All right, um, and then finally, uh, bought later was. Uh, Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes number 247, the Whitman variant. Well, no, I guess I didn't buy it. My mom 
my mom did. She bought it, this for me at a Goodwill store. And, uh, and so whenever we would go there, again, frequent shoppers at Goodwill because of our money situation, um, I started looking for comics there whenever we went. I would later buy the regular issue version of this. And so 247 came out in 78. So that's, uh, I, I, my vague recollection is, is that my mom bought this for me maybe a year later. So, you know, I, 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 there wasn't much time between when this was published and when I got it. Some other uh, notable comics that I don't have uh, that came out in October 1978 primary of which is the canceled comic cavalcade issues one and two which came out at the beginning of october this information came from the the dc database wiki the ccc featured a two-volume collection of unpublished stories artwork and other material that was originally slated as next issue stories for over 35 comic book titles which were discontinued as a result of the 1978 dc implosion uh, the purpose of the collections were to preserve copyright on the material, despite it being from canceled comics. And uh, I believe that only 35 issues of this were printed and handed out to various people at DC Comics. Somebody outside of DC got a copy as well to prove that it actually was uh, in existence. So, it, yeah, that's very interesting. I would love to get a, a copy of this, even just digitally. I wish, I wish DC would release this uh, on their app. Uh, anyway, um, and then also Marvel Tales number 99. And I think I talked about this previously, at least a couple times. Uh, this is notable for me personally because I wanted to read this second part of the Death of Gwen Stacy story which, that I read in Marvel, T the first part of which I read in Marvel Tales number 98, which was one of my very first comics that I purchased myself. Um, it would be many years before I could read this issue. And when I did, I have to say, I was a little disappointed in its execution. <laughs> Probably not, not so much having to do with the, how the issue itself was put together, the story it was telling, but, um, you know, I, I had built it up in my head for so many years about how I wanted Spider-Man to deal with the Green Goblin and his role in killing Gwen Stacy. I have to revisit that story again at some point. I have I have a new epic collection of that time period for Spider-Man publication history, and so I, I need to just go back and read that again. Okay, those are the the um, comics that I purchased uh, later and the notable comics. So let's just get right into Amazing Spider-Man number one eighty eight, a comic book that I have not read in forty five years. <laughs> <laughs> so it was really interesting to get back to this. Uh, this is by Keith Pollard, who did the layouts. Marv Wolfman, who was the writer and editor. Michael Esposito did the finishes. Bob Sharon on colors. James Novak letters with a cover by Dave Cockrum and Terry Austin. Uh, and I'll talk about the cover later. So uh, the synopsis for the, the story titled The Jigsaw is Up. And this is from the Marvel Database Wiki uh, with, with some changes. As part of a mystery villain's plan, when Electro took out the Indian Point power plant in the previous issue, it allowed for the next phase of his revenge scheme against Spider-Man to happen, sending a number of men to break into the cryonics building and capture the body of John Jameson, who has been stored there in suspended animation. And I honestly don't know why. Uh, something I'll have to check into. While at a New York hospital, Peter Parker and Betty Leeds pay Aunt May a visit, and Peter is visibly emotional about Aunt May's condition. Leaving May, Betty decides to take Peter out to have some fun. Meanwhile, in the secret hideout of the criminal named Jigsaw, the disfigured criminal's men begin to voice their displeasure over their lack of action of late. Although Jigsaw makes no attempts to hide the fact that he is scared of running into more costume superheroes, he eventually acquiesces to his men's protests and agrees to take them on a heist. While they prepare, Betty brings Peter on a nighttime boat cruise with Flash Thompson, Shashan, Harry Osborne, and Liz Allen. Meanwhile, J. Jonah Jameson hears the news of his son's kidnapping, being uh, brought out to supper by Joe Robinson. Jameson figures that Spider-Man is somehow involved, but Robertson tells him to keep Spider-Man out of this and reminds his boss that he has reporters who can investigate this. Meanwhile, on the cruise, Peter talks to Betty about their relationship because of her recent separation from her husband, Ned. Uh, and they are both spotted by Mary Jane and her new boyfriend, Brad Davis. 
Peter and Mary have a, uh, a chili exchange that doesn't end well. It's then that the boat is attacked by Jigsaw and his men, who demand that everyone turn over their possessions. Peter manages to slip away and change into Spider-Man and fight the crooks until Jigsaw takes Liz and Harry hostage. Not wishing his friends to be killed, Spider-Man lets them leave, but not before he can tag Harry with a spider tracer. Changing back to Peter Parker, Spider-Man waits for the boat to return to shore and leaves his other friends to resume his chase for Jigsaw, who, beginning to crack due to Spider-Man's appearance, agrees to let Liz and Harry go when he feels he's safe. Spider-Man finds the couple shortly after and they point him in Jigsaw's direction. Spider-Man's pursuit puts the crook into an increasingly manic state. When Jigsaw finally gets a bead on Spider-Man with his gun, Spider-Man calls his bluff and the criminal finds that he cannot bring himself to shoot. After webbing Jigsaw up for the police, he leaves and considers his financial situation, as well as the one with Mary Jane and Betty, and then he realizes that he left his camera aboard the boat and that it's probably lost to him now. So my recollection about this issue is how much Spider-Man scared the bad guy, Jigsaw. And this was my first encounter with that character, and I've never read him again. I've never seen him in any other comic book since then. I I, ha- I know that he has appeared in, in other issues uh, of Marvel Comics, but I've just never encountered him. The cover depicts that aspect, or at least that Spider-Man is about to capture him, and it's the cover I remembered most about this issue, with Jigsaw below Spider-Man, who appears to be kind of jumping down at the, uh, on, on the villain, but it's the composition by Cockrum and Austin that is brilliant. The setting is a pitch-black place, with the only light being the the rounds uh, of ammo being fired from Jigsaw's rifle and the spider signal from Spidey's belt, like a target shining on, on uh, Jigsaw. Spidey himself is like he's cloaked in the darkness because his body is outlined only by the red webbing parts of his costume and everything else is black. So forget your alien symbiotes. This is the black-suited Spidey that I want. <laughs> So yeah, that was uh you know when I this this is a this is a title that I actually got rid of at one point. And uh when I was at some point I was realizing that there were certain issues that were no longer in my collection and I wanted them back, I went out and, and purchased this again. And uh it it was it was mostly the cover that I was wanting, uh, that I was thinking about. Uh that and and uh like I said what I remember most about this is is uh, how Jigsaw reacted to Spider-Man. So, uh, speaking of Jigsaw, in this issue is 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 a bit of a sad sack. Um, he stammers in fear when he talks about superheroes and Spider-Man in particular, and he does this in front of his gang. Why would they follow this guy? So you know, like I said, I this is my first time encountering Jigsaw, but the way he was portrayed in this issue made me curious. Was he always so nervous? So. I did some I did some digging. Uh, reading about his former life as a good-looking mob hitman before the Punisher ran his face through a plate glass window didn't track as far as how he is portrayed here, at least for me. So uh, anyway, I went back and read issue 162, uh, where he first appears, or he appears, I don't remember. I think that's his first appearance. Um, and I still don't get it. I don't, they, they seem like two different characters. And in fact, they were drawn differently. Um, uh, he his appearance in that original issue is far more. He looks far more stitched up uh, than he does in this. He looks more like a like a jigsaw puzzle uh, in this issue, which I I suppose makes a certain amount of sense. Regardless, it's not that I don't like it, but the but the development of a jigsaw psychosis was just maybe too subtle by by Wolfman in in this particular issue. Um, it would be interesting to see how they de- how they depict Jigsaw in future issues from the past's perspective. <laughs> he seems like he could be like a uh, like a like a two face like character, always at odds with his murderous and broken sides of his personality. Like I said, I'm curious if they what they do with this kind of crazed personality or dual person. I'm not, I'm even really sure the, the right term here. So, uh, regardless, anyway, um, I have to say though, I preferred the Peter Parkerness of the issue over the Spider-Man stuff. Uh, he's acting like Aunt May is going to die when they're in the, ho- the hospital room while telling her she'll be out in no- out of there in no time, which actually tracks. I went through that with my mother too. Um, 
As he hugs her in the hospital bed, he tells her, I love you. I'll always love you. Uh, but Aunt May just wants to wants to watch her stories on TV and, alone and shoes him and Betty, who is with him, uh, shoes them out, telling them, if you want me to feel better, go out, enjoy yourself. Life is for the young. If you let it pass you by now, you'll never have another chance. Wise words. On the Midnight Cruise, which was a wonderful gesture by Betty and Peter's friends who were footing, helping to foot the bill, uh, even though... Harry gave Peter a bad time (laughs) about it. Peter confronts Betty about their relationship. She's a married woman, after all, and as Betty stresses to him and others, uh, she and Ned have separated. So I guess her pursuit of Peter is okay? Uh, As she tells Peter, quote, I left Ned. There's nothing wrong with picking up something that should never have been dropped. It's great, good rationalization, Betty. Uh, given that MJ turned down Peter's marriage proposal in issue 183, as hotly discussed in this issue's letter column, Betty, to me, seems to me, is a for Peter, is a rebound, comforting, a comforting relationship for Peter at this moment, um, but at least he's not, <laughs> forgive me, consummating the relationship with her, at least as far as I can tell. Uh, I have been under the impression that Betty was older than Peter when, you know, she worked for JJJ at the Bugle uh, as his secretary. And so I just thought that she was like in her early 20s or something while Peter was still in high school. And I know that there was this uh, mutual attraction at some point. Uh, So, you know, I, I thought there was a bit of cougaring going on, even though at best, you know, if she's like 20, let's say, and he's. I don't know, 15, 16, you know, four to five years difference, which is not a big deal when you're older, but you know, this doesn't quite work. And if, if, if indeed she's 20 and he's in high school, regardless, researching this issue, it seems I was wrong and they are similar ages, similar ages. Anyway, I am, I'm curious to see how this relationship progresses, uh, not least of which for her separation and then leads and all that stuff. Uh, speaking of relationships, despite MJ having a boyfriend with her, uh, after Liz let it drop before what Betty had planned for Peter and she and MJ shows up, uh, the, the boyfriend calls Peter a zero, but MJ is, is as we are shown <laughs> very explicitly, uh, is still in love with our hero thanks to uh, a thought balloon revealing that she thinks he's two zeros with a one before them. And I, and I wanted to make note of that because I thought that was kind of a somewhat poetic way of, of expressing her love. Uh, to herself, anyway. My final thought is how much I enjoyed the old Spidey jokes uh, in this issue. When when Spider-Man confronts Jigsaw and his gang on the boat, he gives them a lesson in manners, telling them, Hi, my name's Spidey. Want to see my foot? As he kicks a crook. <laughs> it's, just, it's stupid, right? But I, I just, I, when I read Spider-Man comics back then, I just, I just had a lot of fun with his quips. Uh, another of the gang calls Spider-Man nuts, to which he replies, come now, I've been called psychotic, neurotic, and often late for dinner. <laughs> but nuts is really getting personal. Yeah. Sounds like a, a Rodney Dangerfield type of joke, or I don't know, uh, uh, George Burns, um, Bob Newhart? I don't know. You know, it's not highbrow humor, but, you know, I, it's it's a, it's a comforting Spider-Man silliness is how I thought of it. All right, so that's that's my thoughts on the issue. What did other people think about it uh, in uh, a future letter column? I, I may have to rethink this part of uh, my comics history episodes because I discovered, at least with the Spider-Man title, that the letters page disappears from the comics in the Marvel Unlimited app. Fortunately, the letters for issue 188 was the last letters page to appear, so I do get to proceed with the feedback. That was for this issue. Uh, Okay, Archie and Kirby loved the cover as well, with the latter praising the depiction of a very human antagonist. Yeah, so that was one thing that um, Kirby was talking about, how Jigsaw has a a very human reaction to these super powerful people. And so even though he's expressing his fear in front of his gang, which is, you know, probably not a good idea, it's still very real in that sense. So, yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, Reggie really liked how most of the issue was about Peter, his problems, and his friend circle. 
uh, just like the Lee Kirby Spidey comics of old. And I totally agree. I, that's, that's, a, that's the part, like I said, that I enjoy the most. And if I may break the format a little bit, I wanted to point out Kathy's letter in issue 188, where she complained about Mary Jane Watson. She was relieved uh, that Mary and Peter did not get married. She says in her letter, I don't like her. She seems sh- so shallow, uh, referring to MJ. I don't believe she ever really even loved Peter. Peter needs some new girlfriends. Someone like me. Consider it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought this was adorable, and I'm curious if Kathy uh, kept reading Spider-Man. Um, did she ever change her opinion of MJ and her relationship with Peter, especially given where it ended up? Um, uh, some ads that I thought were interesting uh, in in this issue. Uh, there's a subscription house ad offering a free subscription to Star Wars if you subscribe to five other Marvel titles. And they had a list there. If I had to pick five titles, then I would have chosen Amazing uh, Spider-Man, Peter Parker, the Spectacular Spider-Man, uh, Fantastic Four, Avengers for sure, and I'd have to mm, just kind of uh, accept uh, The Incredible Hulk because of the TV show. As it turns out, I've never really been a Hulk comic book fan or really a, a fan of the character for the most part. But I also wouldn't have cared about the about getting Star Wars, <laughs> even if it was free. But, you know, would I have fallen in love with it, as I know so many had? I don't know. Maybe I would have been more of a Star Wars guy. I, uh, I, I was about to say, and less Star Trek, but no, that, 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 can, that could not be. Not at all. Um, speaking of Star Wars, there was a full-page ad for all sorts of merchandise relating to uh, the movie, including action figures. Uh, ships, which I would have loved. Well, I did love because I got I got a bunch of them. I think that Christmas. Pretty sure it was that Christmas, or maybe it was the one before that. Anyway, plush toys uh, and a bunch of other things too, uh, jewelry, uh, all from the Heroes World Shop in in Livingston Mall in New Jersey and other places too. It it uh, it noted. And finally, in a bit of planned marketing synergy, I'm sure, there's an ad for the comic adaptation of Jaws 2 from Marvel by Gene Colan, Irv Watanabe, and Tom Palmer. And I say that because four pages prior in the story, Liz makes a comment about wishing she hadn't seen that movie. So, (laughs) did Marv know about this ad? Uh, He he probably did, because he was the editor. Anyway... So yeah, there you go. That was Amazing Spider-Man 188. Uh, let's move on to Green Lantern number 112 by Alex Savick, uh, doing pencils, Denny O'Neill, writer, Vince Coletta, inker, Adrian Roy, colors, Milt Snappin, doing letters. And I will be quite honest, I thought this was a pseudonym. I uh, never have encountered that name before. Uh, but it turns out Snappin was a longtime letterer at DC, uh, basically working from 1949 to 1987. Uh, so how did I miss that, uh, in the various DC comics from the late bronze age and going through 87? I, I, I have no idea. And finally, Jack Harris as editor, uh, the cover is by again, Mike Grell and Tatiana Wood. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's a uh, quite a striking cover. So, uh, synopsis uh, for the story called star heart connection. This is part two. And again, uh, the synopsis is from a, a tweaked version of the DC, from the DC database wiki. All right, here we go. Green Arrow and the Green Lanterns pursue the Star Heart to a planet which is one half a magical forest and one half a technologically advanced city. When they get close to the surface, both Green Lanterns' rings get deactivated and they are pulled to the ground. Hal Jordan to the forest side and Alan Scott to the city side. Green Arrow, who was traveling inside an energy bubble made by Hal's ring, lands in between both sides, and he gets chased by guards from the city and trolls from the forest. Eventually, he is captured and taken inside the castle-slash-skyscraper building thing. Inside, he meets the uh, the thief that they've been pursuing, who calls himself Jack Lord Zalaz, who has stolen the green flame of life in order to cure his dying queen, Mala. Oliver is dropped to an underground cell to join ha- uh, Hal and Alan. The cell, unfortunately, is made of petrified yellow wood, making both of their rings ineffective. Uh, 
However, Hal comes up with the idea of combining their powers, which cancels each other's flaws and making them quite powerful. They escape and confront Zalas, who uses the Star Heart to merge his power and revive his beloved queen. The Green Lanterns stare in awe at the beauty of the queen, but not Green Arrow, who says that if he did, he would consider all other women ugly in comparison. Suddenly, the Star Heart starts talking in the same voice that Alan heard when he found his Green Lantern, and as he recounted to Green Arrow earlier in the issue. The Green Flame of Life asks his power to be returned, and the beautiful queen accepts, giving her life once again to take the heart, the Star Heart, back to Asun. As her last act, Mala also returns the heroes to their respective Earths. The end. Okay. Last time, when I talked about issue 111, I was a little disappointed in my reread of it, and this this continues that a little bit, uh, FYI. Uh, they really strain the idea of magic versus science, or you know, the duality of each in this story. It came across almost, to me, like an animated Star Trek episode. Uh, plus, the way Savick drew both groups of people suggests, to me at any rate, evilness, or you know, it's some sort of evil quality. Um, in that the the techies from the city looked a lot like Nazi soldiers to me with their helmets and their outfits and the weapons, uh, while the magis, <laughs> for lack of a better word, looked, as Ollie points out, like trolls. Though, to me, they look uh, more demonic in nature with these horns coming out of their foreheads and they're colored more red in more red tones. Anyway... So, you know, I, I'm not quite sure what, what they were going for there. I, I, they were going for fantasy, but it, I don't know, it, it seemed more like religious imagery to me. Dressed up like fantasy. It was just, it was, it was an odd combination. Uh, but the Starheart thief, who, who, as I said, identified himself as Jack Lord Zalas, noticed the palindrome, which suggests that duality again, but it's, it's all one and the same. Well, anyway, uh, the split, it's odd. So come uh, anyway, he comes across more as a reluctant thief, a knight who did what he did out of devotion to and love for his queen. So even though he attacked them in the previous issue, you know, he, he is a thief. He did steal it. You know, his his motives are altruistic from his point of view. Anyway, uh, he's even polite to Ollie and his other guests, even though they can never leave their imprisonment, he tells them. By the way, I thought perhaps Jack Lord, and this is spelled Jack, J-A-C-K dash Lord, L-O-R-D, uh, was some sort of antiquated title or maybe a play on a title, uh, an honorific. But all I could find uh, when I searched this was search result after search result on actor Jack Lord from Hawaii Five-0. Maybe Denny was a fan of the show. Uh, ultimately, though, Zalas sacrifices himself to restore his queen, making him more of a tragic figure, which I thought that was very interesting. But, you know, R.I.P. Zalas, we hardly knew you because uh, he really only appeared on a few pages, ultimately. But the queen also, even even less, uh, less uh, page time, uh, Mala, is, and it's spelled M apostrophe L.A., I was looking that up too, and the best I can come up with is maybe this was a a sort of shortened form of Milady. Anyway, so Mala awakens, and when the Green Lanterns gaze upon her, as as was stated, they do state that she is beautiful. With Alan saying she's unimaginably beautiful, uh, but Ollie does refuse to look upon her, saying uh, saying what uh, he he said, uh, and and in my mind, you know, he said women, but you know. <laughs> Is he, is he referring to, I, I, I took it as he's referring to Dinah. Uh, anyway, but but why does he think that? Zala stated earlier that he stole the star heart for the sake of, quote, the most beautiful of all creatures. But Ollie turning away and saying what he, what he did suggests some sort of supernatural element to Mala's visage, but it's not presented that way. I mean, it kind of is, maybe more clumsily presented that way. I just, the the ideas were there in this two-part story, but the execution was not so great. Uh, and this idea of of uh, her being so beautiful that you, you forsake all others or something, 
was reinforced later in the letters page about this issue, with editor Harris responding facetiously that, quote, we're not going to trust even Savick to, dr- to try to draw the most beautiful woman in the universe. Well, first of all, way to downplay your artists there, buddy. <laughs> I, th- I thought I thought the art team did a great job of suggesting her beauty, even though we don't get to see her face. So I, you know, whatever. Moving on from <laughs> from uh, the Queen, when I first read this reveal that the Star Heart was the source of the green flame that powers Alan's ring, I thought it was cool that Denny had tied the two Green Lanterns together back then. Anyway, had tied the two Green Lanterns uh, together across and across the mu- the multiverse referred to in this issue as the omniverse, a concept that returned to the to uh, DC cosmology in recent years. Uh, I was looking it up, and I think the first appearance, according to my, my resources, was in 2018. So that's interesting. I just, again, you know, there's so much to do with the DC cosmic that stems or, yeah, originates from Green Lantern stories, comic books. So I, again, here's another thing. Uh, I don't. I doubt that they played that part up. They, you know, it's just it's just an offhand reference. So, but I thought it was really cool. Anyway, back to back to my point. I thought it was cool then. I uh, now I I, I, I kind of wish they hadn't done that. It makes Alan the first, and you know, in my humble opinion, the best Green Lantern. I know I'm going to get some flack from some people <laughs> that I know about this. Uh, subservient to Hal and the Green Lantern com- concept in Earth-1, in a way. Of course, once the crisis happened and the Earth-2 JSA heroes merged into the history of Prime Earth, I guess that viewpoint is essentially moot. So I don't know why I don't know why I should even bring it up other than I didn't like it <laughs> on, on reread 45 years later. Regardless, the Green Flame states that it must be contained or Havoc will rule. So Mala, who just woke up from near death, being in a state of near death for who knows how long she sacrifices her waking existence her 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 being herself to guard the star heart within a sun that i don't know it just it was just so casual that she's like oh yeah i should do that let's go anyway and uh, cuz i did some i did some reading uh it's unfortunate what happens to her and and the star heart itself in the future, in the way that uh, future writers decide to take the whole Starheart thing. So, that's what I thought of the issue. Uh, what did the readers of the time have to say about this this issue? Again, finally, uh, thanks to Peter Rios and Nevada on Mastodon for providing me with the scans of the letters pages about this issue. Generally, most really like the story and the team-up. Uh, both Tom and Francis praised Alex Savick's art, to which editor Harris indicated that Alex would be around for a while. In actuality, he would be on the title until issue number 119, and then return for a few issues starting with uh, 130. Uh, but then it looks like he moved over and did a lot of issues, and not just these, but a lot of issues, in the Superman family of books through the mid-80s. So... Um, I'm going to have to pay attention uh, or at least look at my collection and see what else I have of Savick because I I generally liked his work in these two issues, even if some of the execution was was not quite up to par. But I'd like to see how, uh, you know, how how his art progressed over time. Um, let's see here. Al really liked how they connected the origins of the two Green Lanterns with the story. And Harris asked the readers if they would want to see an annual team up of the Green Lanterns going forward. So retroactively count me in the yes column, please. Uh, uh, unfortunately, that did not appear to be, though we would see him frequently, uh, Alan, in uh, the, um, oh, I just realized it, it's the letter writer, Al, and I'm referring to Alan Scott, uh, <laughs> frequently in the pages of All-Star Qu- uh, Squadron and Infinity Inc. during that time. And then the crisis happened. So anyway. All right. What else was in the issue? As promised last issue, we get the second Superman the Movie Contest, and I thought this was really... This took me down a rabbit hole, quite frankly. To enter, people needed to submit answers to to some DC Comics trivia questions. I think there were 25. Yeah. These trivia questions were printed in the January and February issues, the ongoing series, or the February and March for the bi-monthly dollar comics. 
And so you were you uh, needed to go get those uh, trivia questions on a uh, postcard, write down the answers, and send it in. And so the person who correctly answered all 25 questions, and uh, I should say the first person who correctly answered all 25 questions and was drawn randomly from the submissions, supposedly won, not supposedly, were, were to win the actual cape, quote unquote, that Christopher Reeve wore in the movie, which I'm like, really? The actual cape? I wonder how many capes they had. I'm sure there were it was more than one. But then uh, the second prize was uh, the next 10 drawn submissions that were correct for all 25 uh, won one page of Superman original art drawn by Kurt Swan. So that, I mean, yeah, it'd be really cool to get Superman's cape, but at the same time to win a page of Kurt Swan Superman art, that'd be kind of neat too. Uh, of course, on these contests, just like last episode, I went searching who won the who won this? Was there a winner? What 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 was the history of this thing? And lo and behold, I found something. Uh, my Google search paid off. Um, the grand prize winner of Superman's cape, and chosen by Reeve himself, who was in town to do I think some promotional stuff for the movie, which was across the street from the DC Comics uh, offices. And so he, when he found out about this drawing, he came over and wanted to participate. And so they had him draw the uh, 11 car postcards out for the first and second prize winners. Anyway, um, uh, the person who won Superman's cape was Darwin Metzger of Utah. Uh, and then for the second prize winners that Reeve chose, I thought this was interesting. I'm not going to name everybody, but four of them were also from Utah. So what's up with that? <laughs> and two were from Yakima, Washington, which is only about three and a half hours away from where I live. So I thought, you know, it's kind of, sort of, kind of, sort of a local thing, a local connection. And then as far as the rest of the, uh, the article that I read, the 1600 third prize winners, they eventually had a choice between a two-year subscription to a DC comic of their choice or, and this was the brainchild of Bob Rosakis, to help save them the company money because there were so many entrants for this contest that DC was going to lose a bunch of money in terms of the subscriptions, the free subscriptions they would have to give out. So uh, Bob suggested to um, the president, uh, I think it was Saul Harris. Is that right? Saul something. Anyway. Uh, oh, 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 and before I say that, um, Barbara Zakis was the person who had to determine who got the trivia correct in all of the 1600 plus entrants. So uh, they, they apparently did not think this contest through, uh, very well. So, uh, his idea, provide them with a choice. They get that two year subscription or a prize pack of 20 comics from the DC library, which included autograph books, foreign editions, and first or discontinued issues. And according to Rosakis, who posted this on his blog some years ago, over 90% chose the prize pack. And I have to say, I would have chosen the prize pack too, <laughs> I think. Anyway, if you're interested, I'll include a link to the article by Brian Cronin uh, that was at uh, the CBR site. I, I, as I mentioned, uh, there were trivia questions in certain issues. And uh, this issue of Green Lantern was one of those. It was question number seven. So trivia time. Can you answer this correctly without looking it up? Here's the question. There's no prize here. Just, you know, your own satisfaction if you get it right. <laughs> Jor-El served terms as a member of the Science Council, Krypton's ruling body. He was first elected thanks to his discovery of A, the Phantom Zone, B, the secret of anti-gravity, C, the matter transmitter, or D, suspended animation gas. All right. I'll let you think about that for just a second more. If you have it in your head, lock it in, whatever. Did you guess A, the Phantom Zone? Which is the correct answer. Although I suppose B and C could be construed as correct too. B for the fact that um, he he invented a, a, the hover car apparently called the Jorel. <laughs> uh, and C, you know being transmitted into the phantom zone that's kind of like a matter transmitter sort of 
right? Anyway. All right. That was a bit of a long extra thing. So I will leave this issue with that alone. And with that, we come to the end of my second comics history episode. If you have any comments about any of the comics that I have mentioned, especially the two that I reviewed here, uh, please let me know. You can do that by emailing me at longboxreview at gmail.com, or you can leave comments at the blog longboxreview.com. Thanks for listening, and I will talk to you later. Bye-bye.